Hello there. This is going to be a little different. When I was first thinking of making Dragon Age lore videos, I wanted to make definitive videos. Get down everything there was to know about something that could be referred back to years down the line. I didn't want to make videos that felt incomplete or missing information within a couple of months. So, owing to a very optimistic view of when the next Dragon Age would come out, I decided to focus on covering well-explored areas of the lore. You'll notice that most of my content covers Ferelden, Orlais, and the Dwarves. That's partly because I really like those cultures, but also because they're pretty thoroughly explored. Something like the Ancient Elves, on the other hand, is a lot more cryptic and speculative, with many details still vague. We have more information about Tevinter and the Kunari, but I'm expecting a boatload of more details and potentially retcons in Dragon Age Dread Wolf, so I stayed away. I made those decisions back when I thought the next game would release before 2020. It's about time I reevaluate. So this will be my pre-Dragon Age Dread Wolf video on the Tevinter Imperium. I will probably retouch these topics in a more narrowly focused video at a later date, but I'll worry about that after Dragon Age Dread Wolf releases. The story of Tevinter starts with the earliest known landings of humans in Thetis, roughly 4,000 years ago, around 3100 ancient. This tribe, the Neromenians, settled on the coasts of the Notion Sea, and soon came into contact with elves, though they remained reclusive. The elves were the dominant civilization across Thetis, but they were in a state of decline, and the Neromenian initially had very little contact with them. The elves had begun to age for the first time in their history, and some began to blame the influence of the short-lived humans whom they avoided. Around 2800 ancient, certain Neromenian mages began to hear the whispers of the old gods, the mysterious pantheon of dragon gods that the Neromenians would worship for the next two and a half thousand years. These powerful dreamers, referred to as Somniari in Tevinter, would form the priest caste of their society. The man credited with bringing the worship of the old gods and knowledge of blood magic to Tevinter is a mysterious figure known as Thalcyon. Few details are known of his life, save that he was from the city of Neromenian, and used his power to become king of that city some four centuries before the founding of the Imperium. He built the first temples to Dumat, the Dragon of Silence. Some dispute this history, more of a legend perhaps, suggesting that humans likely learned of blood magic and dreaming from elves, or packs with demons called the Forbidden Ones, but we will likely never know for sure. The seven dragon gods of Tevinter are thus Dumat, the Dragon of Silence, chief deity of the old gods and supposedly the first to reveal secrets of magic to humans. Zezekiel, the Dragon of Chaos, also known as a god of freedom and associated with both madness and revelry. Toth, the Dragon of Fire, who aside from the obvious destructive implications of that name, also seems to be associated with the Forge and certain crafts. Anderal, the Dragon of Slaves, though older texts refer to him as a god of unity. His holiday is associated with marriages, so it's possible that Tevinters associated him with social ties and obligations more broadly, not just slaves in particular. Urthemiel, the Dragon of Beauty, who was invoked for both personal beauty and the arts. Razakale, the Dragon of Mystery, whose temple in Minrathis was repurposed as a circle of magi after Tevinter turned away from the old gods. Lastly, Lusakan, the Dragon of Night.
The descendants of the Somniari priests of the old gods would form the aristocracy of Tevinter. The Altus, as they are known, are the most powerful class in Tevinter to this day. Below the Altus, however, are the Latins. This word refers to mages of Tevinter that are born to non-mage families or otherwise have no ancestral ties to the Altus families. They lack the prestige of the Altus, but have several seats in the Magisterium, and a number of notable Archons have been from Leighton families. The greater non-mage populace of Tevinter are referred to as Soparati, a word that means sleepers. They are the general citizenry of Tevinter, who may own property and serve in the military, but can fill only lower government or religious positions. Positions of true authority in the Imperium are reserved for mages. Lowest of all are the slaves and the liberati. Slavery is common, especially after conflict with the elves began, but it also serves as legal punishment and sometimes as a means of repaying debt. Slaves can be freed, but they can never be full to venter citizens. Instead, they become liberati a separate class with restricted rights. While traditionally mostly elves, modern Tevinter slaves are a mix of elves and humans, and more rarely dwarves and kunari. All of this is getting a bit ahead of ourselves, since I haven't even gotten to the founding of the Empire yet. It started with a queen, Livia, High Queen of Tevinter and High Priestess of Razakael. In those days, the Naromenians were split between three major kingdoms, Naromenian, Quarinus, and Tevinter, the latter including the future imperial capital, Minrathus. Livia had a brother, Tarsian, born without the ability to use magic, who coveted her throne. So when she went into labor and the palace was distracted, Tarsian mustered his allies and attacked. He killed all who would not swear loyalty to him, but in his sister's room he found only half of the royal signet ring, having been broken in two. He tracked his sister to the temple of Razakael, where she faced him in full armor. Exhausted as she was, Tarsian killed her, but lost an arm and an eye in the process. Her child, however, was nowhere to be found. The rulers of Quirinus and Neromenian would quickly cut off diplomatic ties, as they would not recognize a Soparati king. The next day, near the city of Verantium, a priestess of the Temple of Dumat named Calpurnia found a basket floating by the seashore. Inside was a child and half of a broken ring. She named him Dorinius and raised him as her own in the temple, where he proved to be a powerful and clever dreamer. When Dorinius was 19, the high priest of Dumat summoned the senior acolytes and Dorinius before him. As he was dying, he told them he would choose his successor by way of answering a riddle. They must bring him, that which has no legs yet must dance, has no lungs but must breathe, and has no life yet lives and dies. Durinius brought the High Priest fire, and so he soon became the High Priest of Dumat. Some time later, the King of Neromenian died without an heir. By tradition, a successor would be chosen from among the Dreamers. The High Priests of Dumat, Toth, and Lusican, the patron deities of Neromenian, were summoned. The contest was to be decided, as seemed to have been common in ancient Tevinter, by riddle. The three priests were tasked with tying an egg into a knot and placing it on a pedestal in front of the throne, at which point the crown would be released from the vault. While the other priests immediately entered the Fade to look for a solution, Dorinius did not need to. He smashed the egg, soaked the strip of his own clothing in the yolk, and tied it into a knot. Thus did Dorinius acquire his first, but not his last, crown. On the night of his coronation, the priestess Calpurnia revealed to him how she had found him and the half-signet ring, 
which Durinius's court recognized as the royal seal of Tevinter. Now Durinius was obliged to avenge his mother's murder and remove the usurper from his throne, but Tarsian was holed up in the nigh-impregnable city of Menrathus, which has never fallen to this day. That night, Durinius had a dream that he was in a boat with a hooded ferryman, whose face was always in shadow. When they arrived at the shore, Durinius turned to see that the ferryman's face was his own. He interpreted this dream to be a message from Dumat to take action, so he sent a message to Tarsian that, as king of Naromenian, he wished to repair ties between their kingdoms. Flattered, Tarsian welcomed Durinius and his honor guard into the palace. Durinius cast a spell to prevent interference and challenged his uncle to a duel. By the end, Tarsian lay dead and Durinius had reforged the signet ring of Tevinter. With two kingdoms united under him, Durinius next sought to forge relations with the dwarves by going to the ancient capital Kalsharok himself. Durinius participated in the Provings, the dwarven tradition of ritual combat, and dueled the king of the dwarves, ultimately forging close ties that have persisted across millennia. A dwarven body called the Ambassadoria was established to mediate this relationship from a dwarven settlement built beneath Minrathus. Back on the surface, Queen Rathana of Corinus, knowing she could not stand against the combined power of Tevinter and Neromenian under Durinius, proposed a marriage. Thus were the thrones of Tevinter united, and Durinius declared himself Archon of the Tevinter Imperium in 1195 Ancient, year zero of the Tevinter calendar. For the sake of convenience and consistency, I have been using and will continue to use dates for the Chantry calendar. The Archon is the ruler of Tevinter, but he does not rule alone. The Imperial Senate is composed of two houses. The upper house, the Magisterium, holds the power to make laws and elect a new Archon if the previous lacked a designated heir. Initially, seats in the Magisterium were often passed down among the Altus families, along with most positions of power. But over the course of centuries and some brutal civil wars, Latins gained acceptance. Now, a third of all Archons have been Latins. In addition to inherited seats, in ancient times the High Priests of the Old Gods might have had seats as Magisters, but in the modern age, the divine of the imperial chantry and each grand cleric is a magister. One mage from each of Tevinter's seven circles of magi is also chosen to serve as a magister, usually chosen from among the senior enchanters, though the first enchanters are ineligible. Incidentally, the circles of magi in Tevinter are wildly different from the rest of Thedas, there being the first and oldest, rather than prisons one attempts to escape from, they are more like prestigious academies that are highly selective in who they admit. Tevinter mages traveling abroad outside the Imperium have been known to falsely claim the title of Magister due to the fear it inspires, as many outside the Imperium tend to not understand the Tevinter government and assume every mage is a Magister. The lower house of the Imperial Senate is the Publicanium, which is composed of elected officials. In practice, this body has no real power and is bureaucratic in function. The Imperium would start to have more and more contact with the Elves as it grew eastward over the centuries, toward the border of the Arlathan Forest. When the rulers of the Imperium started to realize there was a non-human, magic-wielding civilization on its doorstep, they sent emissaries into the forest. None returned. Violent conflict with the elves escalated over the course of several decades until several whole to winter settlements bordering the forest disappeared in 998 Ancient. Thus, Archon Thalassian declared war and marched his armies on the elven capital of Arlathan in 981 Ancient, supposedly with a horde of bound demons and dragon thralls. 
Allegedly by blood magic ritual, the elven capital was sunk into the ground and most of the elves enslaved over the course of the war. Bolstered by their new elven slaves, the Tevinter Imperium spends the next few centuries expanding. Soon the lands now known as the Anderfels, Ravain, Antiva, Navarra, and the Free Marches fell under their sway, along with a presence in the Northern Isles of Saharan and Parvolan. Eventually, even the distant lands of the Syrian, now Orle, fell under their sway, and they gained a foothold in the Ferelden Valley of the Alamari. These vast lands were connected by the Imperial Highway, a road of raised stone and archways that stretches from the imperial capital of Minrathis to the distant outpost of Ostagar at the edges of the Kokari wilds. These barbarian lands would serve as a new source of slaves for the Imperium. Division would bring strife to Tevinter, first in 692 Ancient, when members of the Altus families objected to the Archon choosing a latent mage as his successor. This war raged for over 70 years, ending with Leighton's being allowed into the Magisterium for the first time in 620 Ancient. An even worse civil war would break out in 575 Ancient, as the Empire's most influential Magisters went to war over who would be the next Archon, the previous dying without a successor. This was a shorter conflict, ending in 555 Ancient, but very destructive. It is generally regarded as the end of the Imperium's Golden Age. The decline of the Imperium is thought to be part of what drove the High Priests of the Old Gods to do something... drastic in 395 Ancient. As the story goes, these Magisters were guided to perform a massive rite supposedly consuming two-thirds of the Imperium's lyrium supply and the blood of hundreds of slaves to breach the dream world of the Fade physically and enter the Golden City at its heart. This they did, but whatever happened there unleashed something terrible and transformed them into monsters, the first Darkspawn. The first blight began. Within years, a vast horde of the sickening creatures emerged from deep underground. At their head, the dragon god Dumat, warped into an archdemon by the powers of the Blight. For nearly two centuries, the first Blight ravaged the Imperium. The diseased power of the Blight sickened the land itself, leading to natural disasters and famine alongside the Horde. The temples of the old gods faced a crisis of faith, as the chief gods of the Imperium seemed to have come to destroy it. The newly founded Grey Wardens were able to slay Dumat and end the Blight, but the Imperium was left in a severely weakened state. They were forced to abandon far-flung holdings, like most of their foothold in the Ferelden Valley, from which would rise a new threat to the Imperium. At the worst possible time, barely more than two decades after the end of the Blight in 180 Ancient, a former slave named Andraste would raise a rebellion in the Ferelden Valley. Proclaiming a new god, the Maker, Andraste and her warlord husband Maphrath led a vast army of the Alamari barbarians across the Waking Sea to invade the Imperium. To make matters worse, a massive slave revolt was ongoing in Tevinter itself. A somewhat enigmatic elven figure named Shartan led his people using first sticks and stones, then arms plundered from Tevinter soldiers. They would ultimately ally themselves with the invading human barbarians, both having suffered for generations under the rule of the Magisters. Weakened as they were, the Imperial Legions could not stop the Alamari advance. Within a decade of war, the southern lands had fallen, but not without cost. The Alamari struggled to hold their new conquests after the main horde had moved on, and before them the heartland of Tevinter posed the stiffest resistance yet. Andraste wished to push forward until the Imperial capital itself fell before them, but Maphrath doubted 
and, it is said, grew jealous of both her spiritual marriage with the Maker and the fanatical loyalty she inspired in his warriors. Mafarath made a secret pact with Archon Hesarion to betray his wife in exchange for the South. Andraste was delivered to the Archon and sentenced to death. Shartan attempted a rescue of his human ally, but his warriors died on the field in feudal charge of the walls of Menrathis. Andraste was sentenced to burn, but when the time came, she did not cry out or show distress as she burned. Supposedly, the crowd became horrified by her serene suffering rather than rejoicing in the death of an enemy. Then, the Archon himself drew his sword and drove it into her heart, ending her suffering. The Orlesian and Imperial Chantries both say that the Maker filled his heart with compassion and guilt, driving him to show her mercy. A closer look at Hesarian's life might lead one to draw a connection between this event and the Archon's mother, Eleni Zenovia a seer who was transformed into a statue as punishment when she foretold the downfall of his father, which came to pass. Perhaps she gave her son some words of prophecy that influenced his actions that day. Perhaps he simply wanted to give Andraste a mercy his mother would never receive. In any case, Andraste was dead, and Mafarath's new empire was secure for a time. With faith in the old gods on the decline since the first blight, Andraste's faith in the Maker became surprisingly popular in the Imperium, especially among the non-mage Soparati that comprise the majority of Tevinter's citizens. Hesarian faced pressure to eliminate Andraste's following, but he refused to do anything about it. For ten years this went on. Then, in 160 Ancient, Hesarion renounced the faith of the old gods and proclaimed the Maker as the one true god. The priests of the old gods and the other mages were given a choice, convert or die. The Altus priests and even the Latins were hesitant to give up their faith for a god that maligned magic, but Hesarion enjoyed the overwhelming support of the Soparati. In a period of bloodshed remembered as the Transfiguration, most of the magisters were torn down and the old gods abandoned in favor of Andraste and the Maker. The old temples were converted into the first circles of magi, centers of magical study, or destroyed. Hesarion stood as the sole high priest of Tevinter's new religion. He also revealed his pact with Mafrath to kill Andraste to the public. The Alamari warlord soon had his own sons turn on him and murder him. The Alamari empire he had sought to build disintegrated. His eldest son managed to build Orle into a loose kingdom, but Ferelden fell into infighting, and the regions now known as Navarra and the Free Marches were reduced to squabbling city-states. In a single stroke, Hesarion had destroyed all his rivals, both without and within the empire. Hesarion's reforms led to many of the most powerful clerics of the faith being Soparati, who even held seats in the magisterium. But the old association with the Altus bloodlines and spiritual superiority gradually reasserted itself until the clerics were once again almost exclusively mages. This might have been an opportunity for Tevinter to claw back its past glory, reclaim the South, but that was not to be. As the Imperium moved to reconquer the Free Marches, rebellion broke out in the East in 120 Ancient. With the support of the Eastern Free Marcher cities, Ravain rebelled against Tevinter rule. After a series of devastating defeats, the Imperium gradually abandoned the province in 53 Ancient. The city-state of Antiva would unite surrounding cities into the Kingdom of Antiva in 30 Ancient. Not long after, the Tevinter Imperium would face two great threats. To start with, the return of the Blight in 1-5 Divine. The second Blight began in the Anderfels, one of Tevinter's last provinces, first almost wiping out the city of Hosburg and moving east into the rest of Thedas. 
the Imperium was forced to abandon the Anderfels to protect the heartland of Tevinter. Then out of the south there came a rival the likes of which Tevinter had never known, Cordillus Draken. Born of a Syrian mother and a Tevinter father, Draken had united the peoples of Orle as a conqueror and now brought his armies to fight the Blight. In a climactic battle at Cumberland, Draken prevented much destruction in the Free Marches and was soon hailed as a savior across the south, with much of the Free Marches joining his empire. He had then marched to invade the Imperium itself, but diverted to instead relieve the siege of Weishaupt, earning the gratitude of the entire Grey Warden Order. Draken brought with him not just his armies, but also his faith. He had built a new establishment of the Andrastian faith in Orle, which was quickly adopted across the Free Marches and the Anderfels, which had joined the Empire. Even the Imperium would decide to submit their religious practices to the Orlesian Chantry in time, at least to some degree. Why exactly hasn't been established, though I suspect it was an act of appeasement. As I said, Draken had ambitions to invade the Imperium itself and spread his chantry. Tevinter may have acted to compromise, for fear that he would make another attempt. If so, never has the Imperium before or since acted in such fear to an enemy. Cordillus territories in the Anderfels and the Free Marches would assert independence within a generation, but the chantry would remain. Tevinter would attempt to gain acceptance for their clerics from the Orlesian Chantry by reducing the Archon's role in the faith to a purely ceremonial one, but they still allowed men to become priests, which clashed with Chantry doctrine. The Orlesians were also apparently unaware that many Tevinter priests were mages. Tevinter would remain loosely tied but never truly accepted by the Orlesian Chantry for several centuries. In that time, the Imperium would make several small efforts to expand their influence, but none that would last. They supported King Phyrus of Starkhaven's bid to conquer the Free Marches, before taking Starkhaven for themselves when he proved a liability. They were dislodged by the Orlesian Chantry, which declared an exalted march to liberate the city in 280 glory. At the end of the Third Blight in 325 Towers, Armies from Orle and Tevinter worked together with the Grey Wardens at the final battle at Hunter Fell. In the aftermath, both armies promptly turned on the Navarans and seized territory, with Tevinter taking the city of Hunter Fell, though they would lose it to rebellion in 349 Towers. The greatest point of contention between the Orlesian Chantry and the Tevinter clergy was their interpretation of Andraste's teaching that magic exists to serve man and never to rule over him. In the Orlesian Chantry, this was taken to mean that mages should never rule or hold power in society. In keeping with this, they promoted the story of the Tevinter magisters becoming the first darkspawn and advocated keeping mages largely confined to circles of magi. In Tevinter, this obviously was not popular. Instead, they interpreted to mean that magic should be used for the greater good, which necessitated mages having power. The Orlesian Chantry repeatedly attempted to assert superiority over the Tevinter clergy, and demanded they reform doctrine and practices to bring them in line with their own. Tevinter only ever half-heartedly made any of these reforms, and nothing that truly jeopardized the power of the reigning mages was ever done. When the Chantry finally became fully aware of the degree of the Tevinter Chantry's heresy, the Divine attempted to brand all of them as heretics and demanded drastic reform to the Orlesian version of the chant and 387 Towers. In response, the Archon accused the Chantry and Valroyo of corruption and appointed one of the Tevinter clerics, a man and a mage, as the Divine of the Imperial Chantry, quickly called the Black Divine outside Tevinter. In response, several major exalted marches were called against the Imperium over the next century, but all failed. The Imperial Chantry of Tevinter differs from the Orlesian in several critical respects. 
the Imperial Divine is always a man, though some admit this rule exists mostly out of spite for the Orlesian Chantry, which allows only women to become priests. Deventer priests also commonly marry and have families, while in Orlais, priests are expected to be celibate. Clergy work even tends to run in families in Deventer. The Imperial Chantry believes that Andraste was a prophet, but also a mage, and that the miracles attributed to the Maker by the Orlesian Chantry were expressions of her exceptional magical power. As mentioned, they teach that magic must be used for the greater good, which justifies keeping mages in power rather than locking them away. While the Imperial Chantry blames the old gods for corrupting humanity, they deny the story of Tevinter Magisters breaching the Golden City and becoming the first Darkspawn. Tevinter also has its own Imperial Templars, which presumably were adopted before the Schism, but they are radically different from those of the Orlesian Chantry. For starters, they do not take lyrium and lack the ability to suppress magic. Instead of jailing mages in circles, they are more like a police force under the authority of the magisters in the circles of magi. They still police forbidden magic, but they are typically only employed against more lowly mages, or those that have fallen out of favor with the magisterium. For all the religious squabbling with Orlais, the next great threat to Tevinter would come not from the south, but from the north. In 630 Steel, Tevinter was attacked by the Kunari, a group of horned giants with strange philosophies. They came in huge ships armed with cannons. They shattered Tevinter's loose hold on the northern island of Parvolin, and by 642 Steel they had conquered most of Tevinter, though Minrathis remained unconquered. Determined to regain their territories, the Imperium swallowed its pride and allied itself with the Orlesian Chantry. Both divines called for joint exalted marches to drive the Kunari out of Tevinter, as well as Ravain and Antiva. In 784 Storm, three exalted marches later, the Kunari had mostly been driven out of the mainland to Parvolin, and most kingdoms signed a peace treaty with them. But Tevinter did not. The Tevinter Imperium has remained in a state of war with the Kunari for nearly three centuries, most of which has been constantly vying for control of the island of Saharan, though there have been some larger assaults. In 912 Dragon, the Kathaban, leader of the Kunari fleet, staged a large invasion of the Tevinter mainland only to be repelled when the mages and legions of the Imperium responded in force, with much of the Kunari army obliterated. More recently, the Kunari have begun a far more successful campaign, invading and capturing Tevinter cities, but this conflict is yet unresolved. The Tevinters take pride that, though Minrathus has been besieged by Darkspawn, barbarians, religious zealots, and the Kunari, it has never once fallen to an invader in 2,000 years. We shall see if they manage to keep that record. Wow, this is a long one. I kind of wanted to get all the Tevinter stuff out of my system. I might do something similar for the Elves and maybe the Kunari. I do want to revisit these topics once the next game comes out, but we'll see. I have another discount code for anyone that wants one. Until next time, I hope you all have a nice day.